I'm Sandy Goldberg from Antenna Audio. Welcome to the podcast series from Emory University's Carlos Museum. In each episode, we use an object from the museum's collection as a starting point. We'll get to that object in a moment. It sparked a lively conversation about the dead. Well, the American dead and the American way of dying from the 1800s and the way it suddenly came to resemble the way of dying in ancient Egypt. Joining us today are Peter Lacavera, curator of ancient Egyptian art at the Carlos Museum, Professor Gary Latterman, who teaches about American religious history, and Kevin Kuharik, Director of Restoration at the Historic Oakland Cemetery Foundation in Atlanta. Starting us off is Peter Lacavera, our Egyptologist. Now, what happened with Americans becoming aware of ancient Egypt around this time? What historically was going on? Beginning with the Napoleonic expedition to Egypt, um, that created a great craze in Europe of Egyptomania, particularly there was a publication that the uh, French government did, very lavish publication, because when Napoleon invaded, he not only brought his army to Egypt, but brought a whole platoon of scientists and scholars and artists, and they produced these enormous folio volumes called The Description of Egypt, and those sold widely throughout not only Europe, but America. Thomas Jefferson had a copy of his own, and uh, it was also in libraries and universities throughout the United States. And that was often used as a copy book for motifs uh, which were derived from ancient Egypt and then used in uh, 19th century architecture. It seemed even then to be very restricted to cemeteries. So at Oakland Cemetery, do you have some uh, Egyptian-looking things there? We do. Um, The most noticeable one, um, it's highly visible from a busy street nearby, and it's called the Kant's Gateway. It's made of granite, and it has a flat roof and battered walls, a cavetto molding, and a beautiful um, sun disk with serpents and um, bird wings. Hmm, cavetto moldings? That brings us to our object for this episode. If you can see images wherever you're listening to this, you can see it now. It's a false door, a ubiquitous part of ancient Egyptian tombs. This one is about three feet tall. Ancient Egyptians were buried deep underground, of course, But above that would be a little room with one of these false doors. The door was believed to be the magical portal for the dead to receive offerings. The false door was the most important part of the tomb. And this particular one is part of a family tomb. And Egyptians were tended to be buried together in in family groups. Uh, And this is uh, for a daughter and her mother. And people were supposed to come on certain feast days and holidays leave food offerings at the fall store for the spirit of the deceased, and then they could eat the leftovers. So it was a big kind of almost a social thing, and there were actually certain days when people, lots of people would go to the cemetery and, and picnic. And this is a very typical example, which, again, is the panels, usually a little plaque showing the deceased at a table of food offerings, and then surrounded by the torus molding and the cavetto cornice, which are typical of Egyptian architecture. In the 1800s, American cemeteries made a radical shift. Suddenly, they became pastoral settings, places appropriate for family picnics. That idea really emerges in the middle of the 19th century, um, and is especially tied with what's known as the rural cemetery movement that begins really in Boston with the creation of Mount Auburn Cemetery. And this is a place where people and families can go um, and be with their dead, um, not be afraid of the dead. What was it about Egypt that seemed to take hold? What made sense to Americans that they should put Egyptian motifs in their graveyards? This was a time in which there was a great deal of interest in alternative views of the afterlife and alternative ideas about the meaning of death. And certainly with all of this information that's coming and all of this ripple effect uh, of interest in terms of uh, what's being discovered, you begin to see just a greater kind of association of Egyptian themes with ideas about death. As an Egyptologist, Peter, when you go to these faux Egyptian things in cemeteries, what strikes you about them? I think probably the, the idea of permanence, which is probably why it was so apropos among other reasons for a cemetery. And sort of just the, the bigness to them? The, the yes, solid. they're massive, yeah. Certainly you have pyramids as well, just as mm-hmm. a theme yes. that becomes quite popular uh, in cemeteries around this time as well. The obelisk, we have dozens, maybe hundreds of obelisks. Now, when you were saying the, the Victorians 
you know, really like these pastoral graveyards. When were they before that in America? Well, before, before these rural cemeteries really took off, most burial grounds were associated with churches, so they would be just, you know, churchyards for the most part. A lot of it had to do with ideas and new ideas about public health and science and the importance of keeping the dead and the living um, somehow separated, but allowing for certain kinds of cemeteries to invite people to come in and, and to at least spend some time with the, their deceased relatives. So what about this whole idea of resurrection? I mean, since the Egyptians were preserving their bodies so well, was that appealing? So then the Christian would someday be resurrected in a better state? There was a strong desire to make sure the body was intact and maintained even as it decomposes, and that's important for Christians who um, are especially theologically concerned about end times and resurrection. How was that played out on the American scene? Did most people even hear about all this Napoleonic stuff coming in, you know, coming out in the archaeological discoveries? Yeah, well, it, Egypt was quite popular throughout America at the time. Even early on, you have early exhibitions. There was the very famous uh, Dr. Abbott, Abbott collection. He went to Egypt in the 1830s, I think, and bought a bunch of Egyptian things to show in Manhattan. But there was another man named Glidden who went around the country in circuses and unwrapping a mummy. And after, after he was done ra- unwrapping it, he'd ra- secretly wrap it up and move on to the next, next town. And you could see that in different aspects of popular culture around this time as well, you know, beyond the cemetery and the architecture. And in addition to what Peter was saying, there's also some of the early, earliest films pick up the motif of the return of the mummy. You also have, as another kind of place of architecture where you see this theme, are the new movie palaces. They become movie theaters, become yes, places where yeah. you really pick up on Egyptian themes. And you have a number of commentators relating how going into one of these movie theaters and seeing these images, again, this is the early years of cinema, sort of brings to mind the notion of spirits and the dead sort mm-hmm. of returning to life. So there's a lot of interesting overlap and richness in popular culture as it relates to Egypt in this period. And did that extend, you know, on the funerary level, did that ex- were people actually interested in mummification? Certainly you begin to see um, at around the time of the Civil War an increase in the use of embalming as a way to preserve bodies. This is really a signal event in the history of American death ways. So people didn't embalm t- typically before that period? Embalming was really unheard of before the Civil War, and particularly with northern families who were trying to get their family members back from the southern battlefields, that really a whole new group of enterprising undertakers and businessmen experiment with different modes of preserving the body.